you wanted the best, you've got the best podcast. The hottest, hottest. podcast in the world. In the world. The Chris Voss Show, the preeminent podcast with guests so smart you may experience serious brain bleed. The CEOs, authors, thought leaders, visionaries, and motivators. Get ready, get ready. Strap yourself in. Keep your hands, arms, and legs inside the vehicle at all times. Because you're about to go on a monster education roller coaster with your brain. Now, here's your host, Chris Voss. Hi, folks. It's Boz here from the ChrisVossShow.com. Well, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the big show. When the Iron Lady sings, that makes it official. Welcome, welcome, welcome. One and all, for 16 years, over 2,000 episodes, we're bringing in the most amazing people, sharing their amazing stories, their amazing life, the amazing things that they do that can entertain you, make you smarter, or just make you enjoy a nice, wonderful beach read. Today, we have another new hot author coming off the shelves, 50 Shades of True Crime, Sex, Drugs. And Killer Kink just came out July 16th, 2024. Douglas Pfeiffer is on the show with us today. Douglas, did I get your last name correct? Yep, Pfeiffer. You got it perfect. Fifty Shades of True Crime, Sex, Drugs, and Killer Kink. And no, it is not a documentary of P. Diddy's Freak Fest, which is going on right <laughs> now. But there's still time. You know, maybe that's book two. Anyway, pass the baby oil. So we'll be talking with Douglas as he's, as he's on the show. The P. Diddy. Baby old jokes. There's just no end to them at this point. It's just, it's going to go on forever. Doug is a retired Alaskan police officer who specializes in crime scene analysis, deviant sexual crimes, hostage negotiations, and various special assignments throughout his 25-year career. He's a highly decorated investigator, and he's negotiated with serial killers, solved homicides, and worked real-life cases that will shock you to the core. He started in law enforcement with the Anchorage Police Department in 1996 and retired in 2021. And I'd just like to, for the record, say it wasn't me, whatever whatever happened. <laughs> anyway, welcome to the show. How are you, Doug? I'm fantastic. I know it wasn't you, but I can still pin it on you, Chris. <laughs> oh, shit. Wow. <laughs> that got dark quick. Wow. Check, please. So, Doug, give us your .coms. Where could people find you on the interwebs? Yeah, real simple. It's DougPfeiffer.com. And that's just D-O-U-G-F-I-F-E-R.com. You can watch yeah. the book trail or find all about, out about me. It's Everything's there. Yeah, and please don't pin anything on me. I, I had enough of that at the, at the Freak Fest PDD parties. <laughs> anyway, uh, uh, yeah, there's lots of pinning going on, I guess. Pegging, <laughs> pinning, what? Anyway, give us a 30,000 <laughs> overview of what well, this, this is. One, this is one hell of an episode. Give us a 30,000 overview. What's in your new book, Fifty Shades of True Crime? Yeah. The title, as you can tell, it's based off Fifty Shades of Grey. And what I did is my 25-year career, I took the most sexually deviant cases I ever worked mm -hmm. and took them all, put them together into a book. It's similar to the Fifty Shades of Grey style, but these are all true crime cases. They actually happened, criminal charges or you know, sex, drugs, and killer kink. You either lived or possibly you died in some of this. So I really put it all together and it's a play on words, but the book is, is really key on those deviant sexual aspects of human psyche drugs sex and what was it kink sex killer kink, kink. Drug. killer kink that's just fridays around here at the chris voss show <laughs> and you you wrote this book and evidently it's doing really well who likes it most the men or the ladies not even close it's going to be the ladies and i'd say the that 40 to 60 year old is the sweet spot and as far as the website goes they're the most interactive on the website meaning they ask some really intricate and detailed questions really? about these crimes so they read the book, and it's it's not surprising, but overwhelmingly, it's the women. You need to have a private Patreon or something, a group where you talk about the stuff that you have that much interest. That is pretty wild, dude. Yeah. The big thing is the book clubs contact me, and the new thing is have the author with the book clubs, so you'll go on Zoom or in person with you know, a group of 15 women, and they'll really dig deep into the book, and you kind of talk oh. through it, but mm -hmm. they love doing that now. Oh, do the, does, the, does the camera lenses ever fog up? Anyway. <laughs> I don't know. I've been married a bit. Can't get divorced, so I'm gonna I'm gonna stay that way. <laughs> That's true. Yeah, but you're talking about these hot scenes in the book. So now, when you say Fifty Shades of True Crime, is this an assemblage of different stories from your career, or is it all kind of one character and and plot line? Yeah, no, it's gonna it's gonna be all over the spectrum of my career. So there's probably about eighteen to twenty cases featured in the book. But we're going to go from everything from fetishes to paraphilias to bestiality to necrophilia what? to the 
to killer kink. And that's the type of kink that you engage in that you don't survive. Obviously, you die under killer kink. So it's the whole gamut of sexual acts. By And, and what I like to tell people is these are your next door neighbors. These are your coworkers. These are your best friends. You never know what happens behind closed doors. As an investigator, I got to see firsthand. And, you know, 25 years later, some of the stuff still shocked me. So I put it all in a book for people to read, and it's uh, mm. pretty interesting. You probably have plenty of books in you over 25 years, too. You got a few for sure. Yeah. Killer kink. I imagine that's something people don't go into willingly, or are there some people that are like, I really want to be in a snuff film. I don't know. Sounds like a movie I saw. Yeah, killer kinks mainly the autoerotic asphyxiation. Oh. So most of the, most so of that death yeah. is accidental. Yeah. Uh, where and for your listeners that don't know, that's where you restrict the oxygen flow to have a better orgasm. Yeah. Uh, in essence, choking yourself. But some people do it so well that they don't recover from that, and law enforcement finds them dead in that position. Mm -hmm. And that's autoerotic. There's a lot of different ones. There's total enclosure fetishism. That's where you put yourself in extremely tight spaces for mm -hmm. sexual gratification. And sometimes you don't make it out of those tight spaces. So anything like 10 marriages, <laughs> that's what I'm saying. So it's, it's all over the spectrum on those, those type of acts. Only there, there was no sex anyway. I don't know what that means. But so, you know, guys, what was it? The I, I, N X S in excess singer, you know, he was found hanging from a, a doorknob and I, I don't think it was an intention to die. Maybe there was the karate guy. Charity. Yep. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I love watching him in Kung Fu growing up and stuff. But I think that happened to him. I think Robin Williams really wanted to go. I don't know. I mean, I guess nobody knows really when it comes down to it. But, yeah, there's a lot of, there's a lot of that goes on. And, yeah, stuff goes wrong. And so what do you find, what do you find people gravitate the most or is the most, I don't know, the most salacious stories that people tend to gravitate in the book to? I think they're fascinated that some some of the, the suspects or the actors in the book are everyday people in the community. You know, in Alaska, we're big in the oil industry, so you might have oil executives, businessmen and women. So people that are just mainstream society that then are discovered in these, let's just face it, awkward positions or, or deceased or caught in these acts. I think that's the most shocking to the community, meaning that people knew them very well and never had an inkling that they had these fetishes on the side. Uh, that's what I always, you know, I get as a law enforcement officer, I always get kind of a smile because they would say that the individual, there's no way they could be involved in this. And I must have got it wrong. And trust me, we rarely got it wrong. Does it always, does it, is, there's kind of a joke out there with, you know, it's always the people who are against, who, I, I suppose they, they try and present themselves as morally above the rest of us. Like anytime, you know, you have a preacher who's talking about, you know, gay guys are bad and, and doing things is bad. He was his, seems to be the one that gets caught. You know what I mean? It's always the people trying to portray themselves as the moral high ground. Do you, do you find that's consistent, or is that just a perception of some of these? No, that's that's almost spot on. And, and actually, really? those, yeah, those individuals that you know, when we investigate a, a criminal complaint or a crime, that would profess that over and over again. My uh, spidey sense as a cop would go up even more. Wow. And I would, I would focus more on that individual. And nine times out of 10, they had some part in it. So when they overdo it in that, in that avenue, investigators key on it and they're likely involved. Not always, but I think you're, you're pretty close on your thinking. Yeah. I mean, it just always seems that way. I mean, anytime I see, you know, someone denouncing something, you know, you're like, they'll be on, they'll be in the news next week. I'm sure involved in whatever, you know, I think there was a famous there was a famous pastor who was like, gay, gay stuff is bad, blah, blah, blah. And, you know, he just wouldn't shut up about it. And then they finally caught him with meth and, you know, in a gay massage parlor multiple times. And you're like, you know, it could be you. <laughs> yep. No, it, that, that doesn't surprise so, me. What's that old line? Thou dost protest too much, <laughs> my dear, from Shakespeare. So tell us a little bit about yourself. I mean, did you, were you always writing? Did you maybe have a penchant for writing in your youth? Did you discover this as you got older? Imagine you were a lot of reports as a police officer. What uh, do you, did you see this in your future? Tell us kind of about your journey through life. What made you want to become a police officer and stay a police officer, maybe down that road and how you got here? Sure. Yeah. First of all, cops hate writing. So we'll get that out up front. Writing reports is the worst thing, obviously necessary. 
to document, you know, the, the crimes and get to a jury and all that kind of good stuff. But I was born in Homer, Alaska, which is a really small town of about 5,000 people. Wow. I always, I always wanted to do a job that had some action, some adrenaline uh, mm -hmm. part of it. And Alaskans are really outdoors. You know, we hunt, we fish, we hike. So I wanted something where I could be out in the community. Mm -hmm. So I moved to Anchorage, had applied with the Anchorage Police Department in 1996 and the Alaska State Troopers. Those are two big law enforcement entities. Mm -hmm. Both have had little shows on TV time to time. The Anchorage Police Department hired me first and the troopers offered me a job a week later, but I'd already accepted the first job. And so I started my career then I did, I finished my 25 years. Mm -hmm. But what I found most exciting is the job always changes you work in, in different units, you have different specialties. Every four to five years, I would change to something else to kind of cross train myself as a cop and become yeah. a better investigator. So I really worked the gamut in 25 years. The way the book came about is, you know, about halfway into my career, you go to cocktail parties or friends' houses and non-law enforcement would ask you, what's the strangest, freakiest case you had? And so you tell them about a cool robbery and maybe a homicide and they'd be like, no, no, What's something sexual that happened that's weird? And then you get into it, and that's all they cared about. They didn't care about the robberies. They didn't care about the homicides. They would just ask you multiple questions on these really deviant sexual cases. And Maybe they would start an OnlyFans channel and just read the book. To people. I'm telling you, you might. And to the T, they would, they would want more questions and, and would tell me you should write a book someday. At first, I thought, who's going to read this book? I mean, this is really dark and dirty. I don't know if they'll read it. And then as I got more and more years into it, I was like, you know what? When I retire, I'm going to write a book. Long story short, the interesting thing about this book is I wrote it in about three months post-retirement. I went to, to the six major publishers in the U.S. They all loved the book, but they all wanted a time out to review it because the material's so raw. Mm -hmm. And one by one, they rejected me as an author in the book. They just but, couldn't, they couldn't but publish 50 it. Fifty Shades of Grey is fine and your book's not? Well, that's what I mean. It's, uh, it's, it's real. It's true crime. So it's not, you know, it's not fictional. So they didn't quite get there. Finally, I found a publisher that grabbed it and it's just exploded in popularity to date, which I'm very happy for. But I'm a little biased as an author. I th think it's a good read, but I think it shocks people knowing what happens in every day in every town USA. It, this stuff happens everywhere. And so the book kind of details that out, mainly in Alaska, but I do reference some cases a lot throughout the U.S., Wow. That's that's really wild because we book a lot of we book a lot of Simon Schuster, Penguin Random House, all all the variations that are out there. And you know, we've we've had a lot of these types of books on the show. They're usually written by women. I wonder if there's some discrimination going on there. <laughs> was fifty Shades, fifty Shades of Grey was written by a woman, wasn't it? I think so. I think you're right. Yeah. What the fuck? Dude, I've had some romance novels on that have those covers that are just are just softcore porn on the covers. And <laughs> they're wonderful people, but you know, you look at the cover and of course we have discussions of what's a little bit in the book and you know, there's a lot of naughtiness going on in there. That's kind of wild, man. That's kind of Yeah, wild. there's there's a lot of naughtiness going on in my book and it's all <laughs> it's all real life naughtiness and I think that's where the publishers these are actual cases. So they they got a little bit freaked out, but uh, again, I maybe, think maybe some I think this or I don't know. yeah the second round I think they'd be fine now because they see the audience yeah. likes the book and that's how yeah. it always works. Yeah, you're gonna build a hell of an audience, man. Just get a Facebook group. And I was even joking recently because so many women love the sound of my voice when I not post COVID. I'm still recovering my voice from COVID last two weeks, but I was joking about how I should just go on TikTok and just read romance novels, you know. He, I'm happily married, but you got one hell of a sexy voice, Chris. I'm not your no homo. <laughs> anyway, I don't know. that's the only joke I can come up with there, folks. Let me ask you this: you know, in Alaska, you guys have that thing where one part of the year, like it's just the sun's up all the time, and the next part of the year, I think the the sun's down all the time. If I understand correctly, does that does that make some more, more weirdness stuff go on there up in Alaska than maybe other cities? <laughs> <laughs> I think it does. Right? Police officer. Yeah, there's no doubt about it. Even the lack of light or too much light, I think we can put that aside. Think oh. of it at eight, eight months of solid winter, a lot oh, of darkness. Depressing. Yeah, you can't, yeah. a lot of activities you can't do it. I mean, it's extremely cold out. So you get into drugs, alcohol, 
family members, couples are, are closed in houses and apartments together. So you get, you know, mm-hmm. tempers flare. So I think Alaska has a unique uh-huh. flavor of crime mm-hmm. because of that, just because mm-hmm. of the weather conditions. You're talking about the pure daylight and the darkness. Anchorage in its gets about 22 hours of sunlight on summer solstice during the summer, which is cool. But we have a town called Ukiavik, which is the farthest north you can go in Alaska. The mm-hmm. sun sets in November. It doesn't rise again until the end of January. So imagine those residents. You're in pitch black for several months. That's yeah. kind of hard to, to deal with. So I think it certainly affects the crime in Alaska. Wow. That is crazy. Um, that is crazy, man. That is crazy. And, and I imagine... I would imagine that's just, you know, just leaves room for some de- sexual, you know, if you're in darkness and all the time, you know, I mean, it's a depression. I mean, I, I, I live in Utah and, and just being in the winter, sometimes you get cabin fever, you know, you get a little weird where you're just like, you know, I, I got to get out and do something, you know, nothing that I want to kill people. Not yet, at least well, there's still time, but uh, you know, try and. Trying, I try and avoid anything that gets me arrested. I'm kind of, I really don't want to be in a cell with P Diddy and and R Kelly because that just does not sound like a fun place to be for me. Get that as well. I, I don't think I do well in prison, Chris. So I'm gonna, I'm with you on that. <laughs> you and I, man. I, I yeah. the only the closest I ever got to prison one time was decades ago. I went to a Raiders game as a Raiders fan, and it was the Raiders versus San Francisco 49ers, and it was literally just fights. We, we kind of like 10 fights within 20 feet of us. People flying down. I mean, it was just, it was like living on a prison yard that was unregulated. And I'd never been so scared in my life. And I'm a Raiders still, fan. Still a Raiders fan. All right. You're, still, I think you're you're 500 this year. You're two and two. So maybe there's a chance. Yeah, there's never a chance. I just, <laughs> It's tough being a Raiders fan. But could be a Browns fan. So that's fine. That's, or the Bills. That's true. Anyway, at least we got a Super Bowl. What else haven't we talked about your book? What's the future bring? Is there any plans to put out a second book? I mean, I imagine you just have limited stories. Yeah, the the first book, again, is going to cover the real deviant sexual stuff, and there's a lot of interesting cases in there. The second books, or subsequent books, I think will focus more. You know, I've had some interrogations, hostage negotiations with serial killers, so I think I'll focus the second book on some more traditional true crime. Mm -hmm. What I wanted to do in this initial book is – kind of break out of the box a little bit. There's, you know, there's 10,000 true crime books written by cops out there. There is no true crime book written huh. with 50 shades of true crime focusing on sexual deviancy. So I wanted to break out yeah. of the mold a little bit, establish an audience. I will certainly bring some more traditional true crime, serial killers, interrogations, fascinating cases that I worked long-term in future books. But this is really one to get out of the box, separate myself as a true crime author, former law enforcement, and then go from there. And I, it sounds like you could build a really great community of, of, of followers from what you're doing with women and interacting with them, start a Facebook group, Patreon. I know that the people that come on the show that are novels, romance novels, and just normal novels like stories and stuff, I mean, it's just amazing how rapid their followings are and how much they really love that stuff. I mean, I'm off a sit and thought, why am I writing business books? I should write novels because people, people love it. And they love the escapism of it, the entertainment of it. You know, it's the same, probably the same reason a lot of women watch those murder shows. What are they called? Uh, True crime documentaries. True crime documentaries, yeah. yeah. And you're just like, you're just like some, you know. Anytime I see some some people that are like really into it, you're just like, I don't, I don't know how. You, in fact, I've, I think I've asked some some of the true crime novelists on the, on the show. I'm like, does your husband not sleep with his eye open watching you at night, <laughs> keeping an eye on you? Because I would. Yeah, I think I think that's true. Crime is a hot category now. There's yeah. no doubt about it. So I'm lucky to be in that genre, writing books. But some of the questions and feedback I get on my website, you know, yeah. I, I was a cop for a long time. It even shocks me some of the things women ask you just wow. point blank on your website. So it is interesting, but it's a hot topic. I get it. <laughs> it it's a good good place to be at right now if you want to sell books and and, and talk about real life cases. Wow. That is that is wild, man. That is wild. But you know, I guess what are you gonna do? Anything more we want to tease out on the book before we go, what you're doing there and I don't know if you want to tease out any stories maybe that were salacious or you know salacious enough we can put it on youtube <laughs> yeah the the book's going to talk a lot about fetishes and paraphilias and it uh, it has the gap the spectrum of all of it you know i have some paraphilia inter- if you don't mind me interrupting i'm sorry 
Yeah, the paraphilia is. That is. So a fetish is, is like a sexual gratification where it's strongly linked in activity. Yeah. That's quasi normal, depending what it is. A paraphilia is persistent and intense and to where it probably inflicts harm on yourself or somebody else. So let's take something like sexual sadism. Yeah, that's, that's the act of inflicting pain on somebody for your own sexual mm -hmm. gratification. That's a paraphilia. If you like autoerotic, like breath play, mm -hmm. that may be a fetish, not, not as serious as the other. But I talk about those throughout my book. But interesting cases is I had a, this was one of my, my best and my most memorable is as an hostage negotiator, I was sent to a call and the female in the house had sent out a message to the hospitals, her doctors, that she was going to come there and kill everybody in the hospital. Oh. Obviously, please respond. She had a loaded firearm. We make contact with her and, and talk her out to keep her safe, why she wants to kill people, all this. She had a fetish for lust murder, meaning that the thought of killing somebody actually sexually aroused her. But during the conversation as negotiators, you want to find out everything about the individual. I don't care what it is sexual mm -hmm. preferences, political preferences, what jobs you work. In the course of this conversation with her, and she knew I was a negotiator from the police department, mm -hmm. she told me that she was a Hollywood celebrity and actually was in this, a Playboy centerfold. Now, as a negotiator, I paused the, the phone because I was communicating. Mm -hmm. And with my other negotiator, we kind of laughed out loud because there's no chance in hell that she was a Playboy bunny. Mm -hmm. Long story short, after about two hours of negotiation, we got her to come out safely. She had a loader firearm. She gave up. And then we typically negotiators leave, but our SWAT team said, hey, you might want to come in and look at this. So we came in the house and lo and behold, she was an actual Playboy bunny, pictures with Hugh Hefner and her centerfold above her bed. Her, her kink was the thought of murdering somebody sexually aroused her. Now, this was many years past her centerfold, let's keep in mind. Yeah, yeah. But it always fascinated me that... It you didn't never make know. The Playboy interview, huh? <laughs> yeah, it didn't didn't make that. But you never know who you're going to negotiate with. So that kind of taught me a great lesson as a cop because I didn't believe her. Mm. You never know. You never know with people. I guess Hugh Hefner dodged a bullet there, as it were, literally. <laughs> that is weird. And maybe you know you've seen some of these women that have I don't know about guys, but there's some of these. I I, I think it's surprise. It's still surprising me to see women do it. I still have kind of a a a blind spot for the women have really changed and become masculine in the last in a lot of years but you see a couple of these women that there's there's recent women that have killed a guy there's one there's one guy she locked her guy up in a piece of luggage because i guess it was her kink or something and then she yep. let him die in the luggage and she just laughed and took pictures the whole time i guess that's part of that geez okay note to self don't date anyone with the kill person fetish. That's not what I need. That was my first five marriages. It's crazy, man. You give me it stuff is. to think about. But uh, yeah, I don't know. I guess, I guess, note to self if you find a gal who's got 50 shades of true crime on her, on her desk, pull up your pants and run. <laughs> be, be careful. I always, I always, I tell in the book and I tell people that I talk to that sex is biological like it's a physical feeling there's no doubt yeah. but sex really isn't about sex it's about power so i detail that in my my book i really focus on the human psyche because these are some wicked wicked individuals so it's a power play for them it is the act of course like it is for for anybody but it's really that power play in the in the sexual domination or or being the deviant behavior so it's very extreme i i mentioned in this if you think that missionary style or downloading porn is outrageous it's probably not the book for you but if you, Most if you can thing ever. yeah if you can handle that you're going to be okay with the book but again it, it's extreme but what's going to be shocking these are 100 percent true documented cases yeah most of which that i work personally so i kind of lead you through from start to finish it's the real deal do you do you do you, when you talk about the cases you talk about what just happened or do you get into whether or not they were convicted and, and the, you know, the, the court sort of timeline of it? So it's the full, the full gamut of that. What I do, the first mm -hmm. chapter is going to be name that crime. That's an interesting chapter. What I do, these are all sexual crimes, but I show you a booking photo or a crime scene photo, and I give you three criminal statutes that that individual or crime scene could have committed. You kind of mm -hmm. guess which one, then you're going to read the story and find out what's really happened. 
So it, it's interactive to start. And then I go into the more traditional storylines and cases. You're always going to find out what happened to the perpetrator, suspect, or victim in there. Mm-hmm. But again, it's not traditional where we're going to go through court documents, all of that. It's pretty matter of fact. And we get to the end points on each case pretty quickly. But fascinating set of circumstances on each one that get you there. Wow. All right, folks, if you love that sort of stuff, order up the book where refined books are sold. Thank you very much for coming to the show. We really appreciate it. Doug, give us your .com as we go out. Yep, thanks, Chris. It's DougPfeiffer.com, D-O-U-G-F-I-F-E-R.com. You can watch the book trailer. The book's available on everywhere. Books are sold, Amazon, Barnes & Nobles, bookstores, so wherever you want to get it, audio, ebook. So check it out. I hope the listeners and the readers like it. And they can interact with you on the website. So if you like hearing from readers, it sounds that's great. Absolutely. Thanks, guys, for tuning in. Go to goodreads.com, forward says Chris Foss, LinkedIn.com, forward says Chris Foss, Chris Foss, one of the TikTokity, and all those crazy places on the internet. Order up wherever fine books are sold out July 16, 2024. 50 Shades of True Crime, Sex, Drugs, and Killer Kink. I almost, it's almost like there should be 70s porno music playing as I say that. <laughs> anyway, guys, thanks for tuning in. Be good to each other. Stay safe. We'll see you next time.